All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Darcy. I'm the CAO of HR Primed. I'm uh, welcome. Uh, I'm glad and happy that all of you can join us today. Not everybody that is registered for the uh, the webinar today is present. Um, however, for the people that are here on time, we want to make sure we uh, can keep you with schedule. So uh, the webinar today, uh, one in our free live webinar series, uh, is the future of work is current uh, managing the uncertainty. And your host for today's webinar, um, as soon as I see his picture pop up on the screen, <laughs> is Maurice Lemaire. Um, Maurice is a certified human resource leader. He has over 17 years of HR experience in both small, large, every type of basically sector for fortune ranked companies and Canadian top 100 employers. Uh, Maurice is the bomb. Um, and we're proud to have him joining HR Prime today uh, to uh, conduct this webinar. Um, in addition to the little bit of a blurb I just gave you, um, I can tell you something about Maurice. He's always striving to find the strategic balance between human capital and business performance. His focus are HR and business transformation, talent management strategy, and employee and labor relations. So uh, it's a great honor to have uh, Maurice as part of the HR Prime team. Um, and I can tell you, um, I personally am looking forward to hearing him speak today. Uh, the content of this webinar does not constitute legal advice, even though we like to talk like we know what we're doing. <laughs> no, in truth. <laughs> so um, no, but uh, obviously we're experts at what we do. Um, but um, with anything, especially in COVID-19 times, everything's uncertain. So it does not constitute legal advice. Um, for the people that have registered today, um, you'll be receiving a $75 credit um, for HR Prime's new e interactive e-learning platform, uh, our new downloads, um, unlimited download section, or any of the support services we offer. Um, so you'll receive that code via email, so be sure to take up on it. Um, we'd love to be able to work with you. And be sure to submit your questions during the presentation for the live Q&A. So you see the Q&A panel um, that should be on your screen. We had a few questions that came in before for the presentation, but if you wanted to submit your questions throughout the presentation as Maurice is presenting, we will be sure to get them to the end and answer them for the benefit of everyone. So without further ado, I am proud and uh, pleased to present Maurice. Um, take it away. Darcy, thank you so much for that warm introduction and thanks for having me today. And uh, you know, I'm glad to be here and thrilled to be able to share this topic. And Thank you everyone for taking time from your busy schedule and listen to me today. Um, again, I'm, you know, this is a topic that I, um, I really like discussing and exchanging with you. So I'm definitely looking forward to some of your questions at the end. And my hope for you today is that you are doing nothing less than fantastic. Um, it's a rainy day here in Ottawa today. So if for that reason, you're not quite at the fantastic stage of your day, Let's hope that at the end of the webinar, uh, with some of the ideas that hopefully I'm able to bring to you, you get there. So there you go. I'm, um, I hope I'm not being overly ambitious with that here. So, so let me uh, give you a quick glance of um, the outline today. Um, what we want to do is to bring the business side of HR and how it can impact the bottom line to organizational effectiveness and essentially doing that by enabling people's contribution. In other words, we will be looking at business objectives through the people lens, right? When we get to the impact section, um, each aspect impacted can become a webinar in itself. Actually, some of them have already been developed. So we will really welcome your feedback to see which one do you, would you like to see as uh, in the webinar series next. And today's webinar will be a combination of explaining what you will see in the slide and telling you short business stories uh, to help you relate or illustrate what, what, you know, what we're trying to bring. Uh, keep in mind that this is not a typical practical webinar. We'll be going a little bit more on concepts. And as mentioned, um, some of them will be developed uh, in the near future into more practical webinar, but we're looking at concepts and hopefully trying again to relate them to your workplace so that you can get some ideas in how to, uh, um, whether it's implement those trends or how to deal and how to manage people in that new normal. Again, there will be a Q&A at the end, but as Darcy mentioned, feel free to pop in a question in the chat box as we go, if something grabs your attention and uh, we, will, uh, we will answer that at the end. So a little bit on an overview of the landscape of the current work world. Um, we know lots have changed in the last six months, the way people do work, the way teams are interacting, the way organizations deliver to their clients. 
Um, so keep in mind that, again, this is a summary and interpretation of different uh, publications that we have seen from research firms, top tier consulting firms. Um, and, and really it's to bring that into a way that you can digest it, that you can get, again, some ideas on what you could do. Um, and again, going through these concepts and how they, they apply, they're applicable to you. So I want to start with a quick poll, um, and it's it's to you know we're talking about the accelerate, accelerators of um, you know the concept and trends we're going to see. So my question to you would be, um, what do you think? What led change in your organization? Or actually, more specifically, who led the change? So let me launch a poll here and give you a few seconds to answer if uh, you can see it. But then I'm gonna give you the, uh, you know, what, what has come out in uh, some non very empirical studies in there. But typically the question is, you know, uh, was the CEO or the lead of your business to be the person who led that change or was the head of IT, right? So, and I see the votes coming in, so we'll give it a few more seconds. So most of you have answered uh, the CEO, so or the lead of your organization, and let me share this with you, so you probably can see the uh, the results in there. Um, and what's interesting, and again, this is uh, what I would call a fun take on this situation, but the real driver has been COVID-19. Um, and actually, I can share with you a short story that can illustrate that. So early this earlier this year in 2020. Um, we were having discussion with the CIO of an organization, uh, actually a public sector organization, as they were looking to modernize their IT function. So essentially it was reviewing the operating model, the service delivery, um, changing a little bit the role they had. Um, they were, they considered themselves to be very reactive, simply answering to the question that came in from the clients. And they wanted to move towards being more proactive, more anticipating, you know, bringing innovation, having that strategic and advisory role in the business. Um, as part of also the context, there was, I would say, occasional and almost exceptional remote work uh, opportunities for people. So most of the people had to be inside. Uh, and again, we were having those discussions. Things were, were looking great. We were happy to go in and help them with that. But then obviously mid-March came in with the confinement. So our thoughts were, well, we're not going to hear from them for a little while. Um, but at the end of the first week, they reached back and said, hey, listen, we want to move forward with, with the idea. We just need to, uh, you know, uh, work out some kinks that we have currently, but uh, please, uh, you know, we, we definitely are looking forward. And within three weeks, we had started the project. It was actually a great opportunity for them to start that project. And what they did was actually amazing, and particularly for a public sector uh, organization, Within 48 hours, they had been able to convert most of their workforce to remote workers. They installed software that were needed. They implemented policies with the help of HR. They uh, ordered laptops for those who didn't have. They updated many procedures so that the organization could deliver, uh, for example, um, you know, connect, connecting through VPN. The only issue they had was bandwidth, obviously, because they were, uh, you know, they're a big and large organization of 800 people, so everybody connected at the same time. Uh, was taking a lot of resources, but they really went agile and they really went the 80-20. If the solution was 80% good and able to deliver 80% of what they needed, they went ahead and worked out the kinks afterward. So that was pretty amazing for them. So that's an example of how COVID was really uh, an accelerator. Again, it's a fun take on it, but um, it, it, it brought a lot of new, new ways to do things. Speaking of which, you know, we can move on to what the new normal looks like now, six months later. Um, what we saw at the beginning of COVID is that uh, people were more productive at first. And then uh, in the last few, few months, productivity has gone back to normal. And the key words here are more and normal. The more is because people were probably under the adrenaline, you know, this is new, we're trying to, we have to change, we need to adapt, um, we need to still deliver. And now with the three stages of the confinement, the summer, people have gone back to the normal. And uh, this, is, th this is data that came in uh, at the end of August. Also, 90% of the employees said that working remotely had not hurt productivity. Now, caveat to that is that we're talking about organizations that kept working. Obviously, some organizations had to close down. Unfortunately, some of them have closed permanently. But those that stayed 
uh, had not seen any impact in productivity. And that to me is beautiful because it shows uh, it, it shows our human capacities. We are able, we don't necessarily like change, but we are able to do it and adapt to it. So that, that's fantastic. What we have realized too now, or actually what we are doing now is that we, we know that we don't need to be physically present at, all the time. Granted that, you know, we have been missing those social interactions at work. Uh, their, you know, uh, video interactions are not as good or as efficient as being in person, but we don't necessarily need to be present all the time. That's one of the realizations, but also having to learn new skills. And I'm going beyond just knowing how to use a Zoom or Microsoft team. It's also about, um, you know, new types of software that have been installed since. So it's elevating those, those digital capacities. There is a feeling of overload and that is still remaining. There is a lot of information going on and we need to make sense of that. Um, Remember, you probably remember at the beginning of um, the confinement, we were getting uh, lots of information to the media, news, the, uh, your employers were sending a lot bunch of information. So we needed to make sense of that and gather that information. In order to deliver as well, we moved to be more agile. We had to deliver things fast uh, in order to maintain and improve the organizational responsiveness. And that was accomplished thanks to technology. And again, I'm using a very simple one, which is you know all the video conferencing uh, options out there, but those are one the, the, the type of technologies that allowed us to still remain in communication. And this is one very important to me is that increased demand on individual flexibility. You know, everybody's on a different schedule. People have kids at home, people are taking care of other people. So um, it, had, it had asked for leaders to be really, really um, flexible in the way uh, they expect, uh, in their expectations, essentially. Just an interesting fact here, a little bit outside of HR, is that uh, if you had been following a little bit of the housing market, uh, in some areas, the price for single family home has increased between 20 and 30%, depending on the city. And the buyers are looking as well for bigger homes. And there's the hypothesis for this is that people are looking for homes with office space because they expect to work from home, um, you know, for, for years to come. Uh, and again, this, this is kind of the new normal. People will be working more from home uh, in the following, obviously in the following months, but also in the following years as well. Um, now, let me walk you a little bit through terminology and don't panic. I'm not going to go through each one of them to you. I'll let you read the one that grabs your attention. But the reason I'm bringing this up is I know that you know these terms, but the reason I'm bringing them up is because, um, you know, if you say a phrase such as in order to enable AI to perform automated data analytics, you need to do an agile like digital transformation. I'll let that one sink in for a few seconds there. There's a lot of buzzwords in there, but they do mean something. Um, and in this webinar, we're going to use these terms in the next, in the following slide. So I just want to make sure that you know, uh, we, you know, it, it, we are on the same page. And I'll also give you a little bit of an example of a situation that happened to me where people were uh, using terms interchangeably. Which, well, I'm not saying it shouldn't be, but just to clarify that. Last year, I was doing a, uh, uh, as part of a project I was doing, I was going to bring a process, which was the employee expense claims, uh, into a system. It was being done manually. So you had the employee print out the expense claim form, stapling in their receipt, walk in, bringing it to their manager's office. The manager uh, will then sign it, approve it, then walk and bring it to the finance and admin person who will take the paper, uh, look at the data, input that into the system and issue the reimbursement. And that could take anywhere from, you know, an unusual uh, half a day because, you know, the manager will review, will send, somebody will, will do it to up to five days because sometimes there was downtime, you know, paper time, touch time, the paper was sitting on the desk. And obviously things were getting lost. So by bringing it to the system, we did a mapping. We look at what, you know, what was that actual process that I just described. Um, and one of the, the clients said, oh, Maurice, so you're automating uh, our uh, expense claim. And then I explained, well, no, I'm not automating because I'm, I'm actually digitizing. I'm bringing it to a system because the person will still need to do something. So it's not automating. Somebody will still need to upload the receipt, 
click a few things, send it to the managers via, via email or through the system for approval, and then it will go to the finance and admin person so that they can copy and paste information. It's kind of the same process just being done in a digital way. Conversely, we did a, uh, an automation project as well, uh, which was with a um, financial sector client where at the end of the month, they received all the, uh, they received a PDF, all the mortgages that came to maturity. Uh, and so the person had to look at each of, each of the records, go into the system, find that exact, uh, you know, uh, account, input some, some of the numbers, making sure that they don't make a mistake as they're typing. Uh, then review the line, then move to the next line, and then send to uh, a manager for review. They did some calculations because uh, when the mortgage comes to maturity, there are some few cents discrepancy that they can resolve. Then the manager did an overall review, uh, uh, send it to uh, another sector so that they can print the letters that are sent back to the mortgage owner and say, okay, your mortgage is clean. So that entire process took up about five days worth of work during a two to three weeks period of time uh, going to each record. So what we did is that we brought in automation. We, want, we brought a robot that went in, that wasn't selling to their servers that will take the PDF, look at the fields in there, select the numbers, and I'm simplifying this, but pasting them into their, into their, their appropriate record, doing the calculation itself, and then at the end sending for the manager for a review and approval, and then it will retake that input and print the letters. That entire process was, the robot was able to do it in five seconds. So we've moved from a three week window to five seconds. So that was an amazing saving for that organization, but that's an example of automation, how, what it can bring. So now let's talk a little bit about the trends um, and what, um, you know, the trends is something that they, they were already in here a couple of years ago. Now we're seeing them to be more present or accelerate after the, um, after the pandemic, but there are three categories here. It's augmented technology, the workforce spectrum, and uh, the experience culture. By augmented technology, we know a bit of these terms. We are talking about artificial intelligence, data analytics, uh, and process automation. From a business perspective, that means that you would have to probably install a software or a program or have something in order to perform those tasks. But from a people perspective, it becomes interesting because these become skills. People need to have those skills. In order to have those skills, we need to look at the workforce spectrum in itself. What we're seeing now is what, uh, it's a term that IBM called about two and a half or two, three years ago. It's the new color. What this means is that traditional people acquire skills through formal education. You can think, for example, of uh, you know, going to med school, going to uh, get a law degree. Now, what we're seeing is that people are getting skills and mostly related to that augmented technology. People get the skills uh, through experience. And we also see this in uh, educational institution where now they don't not only have degrees, but they also have badges that certify that you have learned a skills. And for the workplace, it means that a skills is not equal to a role. If you have a skill in, in data analytics, it doesn't mean that your role will necessarily, could necessarily or has necessarily to be data analytics. You can do something else and bring that data analytics skills. Next thing we're seeing as well is increased use of contingent worker. And this is the gig economy. Um, and just before I expand a little bit on that, most people will today would tend to think that gig economy is something that the millennials brought and the Gen Z is doing. But actually we're seeing that going across the spectrum of generations. People now have multiple careers. Uh, and by gig, you know, it's plug and play. People come, they can do a project. They know what they have to do because they have the skills. And they will tend to stay between nine to 18 months in the organization and move on to something else or move on to a different project within, uh, within the organization. The other thing we're seeing too is distributed work where one person can have different roles in, a, in, in one organization. Uh, and I'm not, uh, I'm not talking about wearing many hats, but actually two different, they're doing two different things. They can be working, for example, um, a data analyst can be working with the marketing team and with the HR team. Um, and also another way to look at this work is one person uh, having the same role across multiple organizations. Um, that's something that we are seeing as well. Lastly, we are talking also about collaborative work, uh, teams, communities, you know, the, the sort of thing that brings on wikis, you know, uh, shared knowledge between people. 
Um, just another note on, uh, we, uh, you know, I mentioned a little bit about generations. Um, we are now talking, we're going beyond that. We're going beyond generation. The term is post-generational workforce. It's about seeing the workforce as a whole, not only about one specific category, right? And the goal for large organizations is to get insight through analytics. But that's not to say that there are no individual needs. People need different needs. People have different needs in training, uh, different needs as far as, for example, uh, work-life balance and so on. But it's more about saying that we have, a, we have this, this, this pool of people working for us. What is driving them? What, what's engaging them? Now, the last piece is experience culture. And this to me is really one of my focus as of late, um, you know, employee experience, which for HR, we simply borrowed that from the client experience, uh, which comes more from marketing, but they are very, very connected. Um, as an organization, you want to provide a great client experience. And there's a lots of, and lots of different articles out there that you can see that connect the two of them. Those organizations providing good employee experience are more profitable because uh, they, their employees are providing or, I guess, sharing that experience with the customers. So what are we talking about experience? It's essentially the way um, your clients and your employees interact with your organization. And it, won't, it needs to be easy, it needs to be, uh, you know, seamless to do a transaction with your organization. We, one trend that we're looking to is uh, seamless technology, meaning that people are now considering technology, and this is a trend that is growing, they are considering technology to decide where they're going to go to work. Um, it's not to say that it's the most important yet, but we see that growing up. There's also user centricity. So when you design a process, when you design uh, uh, um, a tool, think about the end user. Yes, it has to be connected to your uh, business objective, but there is still someone who is going to um, be executing that, who is going to be following that process. So think about that person when you are uh, designing that. And lastly is the organization as a corporate citizen. Um, we are seeing more and more the need to manage employee as people first and workers second. So it, there is a greater role for the employer as a social safety net. And by that we're talking about uh, diversity, equity and inclusion, social movements, uh, you know, the purpose of the organization. Um, people will expect, for example, that you have flexible work that will make your talent more accessible and more, as I said, more employees are expecting that. Think also about the leadership trait that are the forefront. Now we're talking about empathy, flexibility, adaptability, resilience, and that is as much as efficiency. So it's about focusing on the outcome and results rather than the activities uh, and time people are doing things. So, um, yeah. So with this in mind, let's look at what the last six months have impacted in the way we work now. Um, and again, we should expect these to remain constant in the following, you know, in the, in the near future, in the future, actually. So, um, again, remember that the followings will be, uh, this can be discussed individually in webinars in the near future. So they will be expanded. As I mentioned earlier, they will be more practical. Again, we're talking here about the concepts and I'm going to give you some business stories so that you can try to relate, uh, to your particular situation. Um, at the same time, think about different situations that you have experienced uh, in the workplace that can relate to this or how you would manage something based on um, the information. The first one is the business transformation. Lots of organizations have had to transform in the last six months. And as the concept is, uh, you know, we mentioned about user centricity, and you can see that person right here in the middle of that triangle. They will interact with your tools. Uh, they will use your tools, uh, follow processes, and interact with people in your organization. So, you need to when you're doing that transformation, you need to think about these those three dimensions uh, as you are redesigning or wanting to implement a change. Understand what what you know what you're trying to accomplish. Find the driver in order to bridge that gap. Let me give you this story. It's less of a nature invol involvement, but really good to illustrate how you can transform a business um, or, well, not necessarily a business model, but how you can transform your business and adapt. There is this uh, person who had a small brick and mortar clothing store. Actually, it was a store within a store. Um, it was a one person. That at some point, they had an employee. And their business model was slow fashion. So, you know, consignment. So they will take your clothes, your used clothing consignment and once it's sold, 
they would split uh, 40, 60 percent, right? And this is actually a great model because it's, uh, you know, as you can imagine, there is a, a minimal inventory. There is no inventory cost. There's a little bit of inventory management, but then the profit is made once uh, the item is sold. Obviously, and unfortunately, we had COVID-19 uh, confined again, so they had to close the store. But what they did is within a few weeks, they switched to an online model. Uh, and actually, it worked very well. People were, were still dropping off clothing, uh, obviously following some health, you know, all the, the um, health and safety precautions. And what they changed here, well, we can talk about, for example, the tools. They had gone and implemented a small inventory management software to make sure, okay, I have this piece of clothing. This is my, my uh, I guess, my, 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 not my client, but the person who brought it to me. Uh, I have it for 30 days. So, uh, uh, you know, it helped, me ma it helped them manage inventory. As far as the process, they updated their website for, to allow online purchases, right? So, um, you know, bringing in the platform so that people can uh, make payments online and all that. If we were to look at the people and culture aspect, uh, in this case, as I, as I mentioned, it was a solopreneur, but if we look at, for example, a larger retail store, we could say that they will require communication on the new processes for the employees, as well as training for those new tools and processes, how they're gonna be using them, how they're gonna be interacting uh, with their client. So again, small story here to illustrate the business transformation. Another thing that has changed uh, with no surprise as people have gone to work remotely is that there is a focus on remote workforce effectiveness. Yes, the studies are showing that people are as productive as they were, but we still need to maintain that. So what you see here, it's a model that was developed by a former colleague of mine, her name is Sissy Wong, and I don't know if she's attending today, but I like to tease her and say that what she did was take Maslow's pyramid uh, of hierarchy of me, cut it, cut it halfway and bring it to the side. So what you see at the top there, is an employee perspective within the colors, how, what people need um, at work. In the bottom, it's the uh, business perspective of it. And I'll, I'll walk you through this because it's an interesting one. As you know, uh, the, some organizations have had to adapt and switch to remote, as I mentioned. Big example of that is Facebook, Twitter, and Shopify. They have gone to permanent, sw they switch their workers to permanently work from home. What people need in order to be effective at work is first, when they come in, they, they got their offer employment, they're coming to work for you. They want to be able to do their job. You give them the basic orientation training and they say, okay, perfect, I can do it. The next stage of that is they want to be good. They want to start mastering what they're doing. Then they will go to feel accomplished, elevated and try. You know, I feel accomplished. I, I have learned something. I'm contributing. I, I, I love it. And the last stage of that is corporate citizenship. Think of it about being proud of your country. Same thing, people are proud of, want to be proud of their organization. And that's fine and dandy, that's cool because it's, we're looking at, uh, you know, everybody wants to feel like that at work. <laughs> the question is, how do we do that? Well, now we move to the bottom and I'm gonna go backwards this time. For you as an organization, in order to implement that, you need to have a movement. So it's the purpose of your organization, what you're trying to accomplish, what's your mission, what's your vision? Is the purpose serving your community? Is the purpose of your answer making a profit? Whatever it is, it needs to be clear and well communicated. In order to have a movement, you need before that to have a community around you, people who are following you, people who are contributing to that movement. So that's done through you know, your culture, uh, the interest, making sure that people's um, values are aligned with your organization. Here we have a little bit of a tech twist to it when we say crowdsource ecosystem, you know, uh, wiki groups, forums, task squad, but the principle is there is that is building that community of followers, you know, around you. Before that, you need to engage with them to get them to the community stage. And by engagement here, we're not talking about employee engagement. We're talking about interacting with them, getting their feedback, their, their, their opinion. And you do that through the design of your organization, your functions, your work, your teams. And the last bit of it is your mechanism, you know, what tools are you using, what system? And you can see here the connection with the business transformation. You need to think about what you want to achieve and then work it backwards to create that, 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 um, that community that, send, that bring all these people together. I would, uh, one point I would make on this is that it's, uh, you know, the title here is work for remote workforce effectiveness, but I would argue that that also works for, uh, even if you're um, physically present, I think this works for um, all type of employees. 
Now, we, let's talk a bit on employment law, compensation, and compliance. As, uh, this also has been impacted, and we expect this to continue to change and evolve. There is a connection here with uh, the workforce spectrum, as I was saying, you know, the big economy. Um, you need to define the needs of your organization moving forward uh, or after you do a business transformation. Uh, do you need full-time people? Do you need part-time employees? Do you need uh, contractors? And again, you know, here we obviously have gone to the distinction between independent contractors, dependent contractors and employees, because uh, obviously we don't want to uh, see Uber type of situations. So uh, at any point in time, um, this is a shameless plug, but feel free to reach out if uh, you, you know, or watch uh, past webinar if you want to have a little bit more information on that. Bringing in this new type of employees will require you to have a flexible compensation scheme. Um, you know, what worked uh, for some employees, it's a full-time man of work for a contractor. People may want to work part-time. So you need, you will likely need to review that to make sure that you can accommodate that new spectrum of the workforce. Obviously in policies, you will be clarifying them, um, you know, ensuring that, you know, uh, for example, the, the most obvious one here will be a remote workforce. You know, what are you expecting? How is that gonna happen? Uh, you know, identify the expectations, uh, communicate them clearly as well. And lastly, that will, be helpful to manage performance, right? Um, it can be managed even if people are uh, working remotely. The trick here is to focus on the outcomes, right? What are you expecting from an employee uh, instead of focusing on necessarily the, the time or the time frames? Granted that some roles or some um, uh, some positions require people to be present at a specific times, uh, but again, that needs to be clearly identified whether in the policy or in the expectation of your performance management. On the health and safety side, um, you know, the pandemic has led to less separation between professional and personal activities. Um, that has increased exhaustion and burnout of some people and simultaneously exposing the stress that people are facing. Um, here I can connect this to the employee, well, the three dimensions of the employee well-being, physical, financial, mental, Laws change in May, in March, sorry. Uh, people change their physical, uh, their physical environment of work change. Um, some people unfortunately had financial stress because they were working less or they had to be laid, laid off, which led to some mental, mental um, health issues. It's interesting to know that some governments are thinking um, on updating their Employment Standards Act or uh, their labor codes in order to incorporate these new realities. Uh, people are working from home, so we're not, uh, you know, employment standards are focused on the employer's est establishment, the employer's physical place, but now we're moving to, to home. So uh, we have seen the push in the last decade from, for example, on the health and safety side to include mental health issues. So. Um, it's going to be interesting to see that those changes coming from governments in the next few months or years. If I can give you another quick story here to showcase uh, the impacts of health and safety and as well as business transformation is um, there is a gym with about six to seven employees. And their model was before COVID, they had about, uh, I would say, between five and seven uh, sessions per day where they will have up to 30 people in the studio going through different stations doing their workout and also sharing equipment and all that. Uh, obviously that, that could not be done after confinement. So when stage three came where they were able to reopen, they reviewed the way they were delivering, um, delivering their service essentially. And what they come up with was, okay, well, let's create boxes that people can move and they will have always the same equipment. However, that brought, the, that brought in that, you know, not as many people could be in the studio at the same time. So they went for up to 30 to maximum of 12. If you do the math, that's a big strain in operating revenue. It, 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 it was almost catastrophic. However, they had a great mentality. They went on saying, you know what? A little bit of something is better than nothing. It's like rebuilding a new business totally, entirely. So let's move forward. And they've been, they've been doing very well since. And they did a very good job at communicating, let's say from the client perspective, what changed. So for example, they had these new um, uh, procedures to come in. You have to leave from another door. You need to sanitize your hand. You have to wear your mask. You can only take it off once you're in the station. On the employee perspective, they have to train their staff on, this is a new procedure. This is what we need to do now. We can't touch uh, the clients anymore. Uh, you have to wear your mask and after each session we have to sanitize so this is how we do the sanitization and all that so um, again 
huge, huge transformation, but they've been very successful. And as you can see, they put whether it's the client or the employee at the center of their process in order to continue delivering. So they still have the same business model type, but they're just delivering it differently. So let me move to the takeaway. Um, three things that I want to cover with you. Um, it's a mindset shift next steps for you and also the aspirations uh what i aspire you to be able to do in the following weeks as far as mindset should goes is the first thing is well we used to have two to three years plan now i mean with the unfortunately way two lurking around uh, hopefully that won't be the case but we never know you need to be flexible in your plan you can still maintain to you can still want to achieve the same goal but maybe the way you're going to achieve it might will be different. So that's where we need to have those flexible plans. If you're moving to a remote workforce or partially remote or however you want to frame that, well, talent is now available anywhere. And I had in the past clients saying, oh, I love this employee, but they're moving because uh, they need, they're going to university or changing cities. Uh, they could work part time, but they're not in the city. They cannot work with me anymore. Well, maybe it's time to review that maybe they still can so you know it's a good time to reach out see they're still available even if they are 200 400 miles away we talk about flexible compensation a little bit earlier uh you know with the new work for spectrum it costs for you to have um compensation scheme that allows you to absorb those uh type of employees interesting one is the skills based journey maps Traditionally, people join an organization and wanted to, you know, go to the next role. So getting promoted. Now what we're seeing is more people wanting to learn skills. And this can be a very good differentiator for you uh, in attracting workforce. You, can, you may not have an organization that allows people to be promoted, to move up, but you could make sure that they learn a specific skill. And I, again, that is a big, that this is a value added when trying to bring in someone to your organization. So you're gonna learn these skills and when you leave, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna be a better person. And lastly is digital imperative. So maybe in January, it was cool to think that perhaps maybe in the next two, three years, we are going to get a Zoom license because we have some clients that are not in the city. Well, six months after that i would tell you that actually nine months after that i would tell you that you must have zoom or teams or whichever video conferencing um tool you need this is just an example of illustrating that you know all these digital ideas and projects are now it, it, it's a must and especially if you look at the trends um are there well you need to have to elevate those digital skills and capabilities so next steps for you what do you do with all this information with all these uh, concepts um, i would say the first thing is you know keep looking keep learning keep being informed of what they are and how they can impact you also understand that there is a potential for development there's a potential to reach something new there's a potential to to uh, be more efficient so uh, capitalize on those what you want to do is to select uh, decide which one makes sense, which are which ones are the quick wins, which one you can incorporate uh, in um, you know in your organization. I know that I've given you a lot of concepts that come from you know research. Uh, they come from top tier consulting firms and what I like to call corporate. So how can you translate that to your context? Quick two quick tips here. The four P's and I like this very much is what's your philosophy on a specific topic. What are your policies? What, look at your procedures and lastly your practices because that's how people do the actual work. You can look, you can take any one of the uh, impacts here or any one of the trends and uh, analyze it from that perspective and find out how you can do it. But the second piece here is very important and this is very, uh, you know, I would have said probably a year and a half ago was very progressive and now I would say it's a must. Involve and engage with your employees, get their feedback. You, you, want, you, you would be amazed at all the information they have about your organization, uh, how they know your client. Uh, I threw in there the design thinking or a design thinking sort of inspired session. You will get, this is very beneficial. You will get, as I said, a lot of insight from your employees and they will be engaged in the process. They will help you, um, you know, get to that next stage. And the last steps, and again, as my second shameless plug of the day is to watch for subsequent webinars. As mentioned, we are going to develop each one of the aspects here uh, into, um, I would say, uh, you know, full-blown practical sessions. So, um, you know, keep, keep an eye for them. 
as I want to leave you with the aspiration, let me do a final quick poll here. Um, I want to know actually uh, which um, which next webinar we would like to see. So uh, I'm gonna pull the poll out. I'm gonna leave it as I'm talk about as I talk about the aspiration, but feel free to start voting on that. So what I want you to do is to make complex things simple. Make it easy for people to interact with organization. Um, make it simple for employees to use what you have. Also, there's a lot of potential that you can discover through technology and that can help you connect many different dots, uh, discover new things, discover new opportunities. So don't be afraid to look for those. On the experience side, treat every one of your employees like your best customer. Again, they serve your customer. Um, you know, treat your employees well and they will treat your customer well. And this, again, there's a lot of studies out there that shows that um, uh, this makes a business more profitable. The businesses that focus on their people are more uh, successful than the others. And last is for you to less to stress less. You know, manage proactively. Keep progress of the of the trends. Um, how you know how they can impact you. Whether it's compliance, uh, technology. What are the challenges, and so on. So that's my aspiration for you. So. Thanks for the ones who have voted. So we have, we will keep these, uh, these, um, um, the topics that you have chosen, uh, we will review and uh, get back to you with probably what will be our next webinar. Um, this being said, that's all about the webinar. Before going to the q and I will pass it back to Darcy, who has uh, some pretty cool offers for you, um, as I'm sure it will, and then uh, happy to answer any questions. So Darcy, the floor is back here to you. Uh, thank you, Maurice. That was an amazing presentation. Incredibly thorough. Uh, it's a lot of information to take in. And I think that's something to keep in mind that the way this was presented was as a overview or a macro, macro kind of uh, presentation about all the, the different things that culminate into one strategy. And, and I think it, I look forward to Maurice uh, breaking this out for us um, in future webinars. So uh, really quickly, so we can get to the Q&A because I know there's some questions. Um, you'll see our information on the screen, uh, our, our toll-free number, uh, and you can reach most of our agents via that number. You'll also see two of our core product offerings. So our philosophy at HR Primed is to make sure that everyone can get expert advice without having to pay an arm and a leg. We just want to make it available. So our on-call support program, whether it be myself, Steve, who I know is on the call, Maurice, whomever, when you pay this, it's $900 and it's a one-time payment. It's for the entire year. You can literally call 500 times. We lose money on you, but you'd be helped. So that's all we care about. So it's, it's, it's a really handy product. We consider it kind of a retainer for our product, for our clients. Um, you get for $900, you get as many emails and questions via phone or email as you need. And if there's anything else, Else that you need, we can help you out along the way, but we're never going to charge you for a membership, make you pay $10,000 a year or something or the other for things you don't need. And of course, our one click compliance. It's all the courses you're required to have to be compliant in Ontario. It's unlimited for $595. Even if you had a thousand employees, it's $595. So it's, it's super cheap. And, uh, you know, check out our, our website, www.hrprime.ca and, uh, they'll, uh, all of it's there for you. Um, so if you want to click to the next slide, Maurice. And this is our team. Maurice isn't on here. He was at the beginning, um, but he should be on there. But you, uh, the, the, this is the, the team that uh, is HR primed. Um, so you can see all them on there. As I said, I think Steve, Steve Caron, who's our most senior HR consultant, a wizard with HR, um, has joined us on the call today. So welcome, Steve. And uh, we're going to get right to the Q&A. Um, so uh, just looking, trying to pop this up. Bring your pardon. So here's the first question. Uh, thank you so much, Maurice, for the presentation. This is very helpful and relevant content. If I like, oh, <laughs> if I would like to reach out to you for more info, what is the best way to do so? Maurice. <laughs> That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, well, we, you can reach out to uh, obviously for HR Prime website, but I'm happy to share uh, my email address um, with the group at the end of the presentation for sure. 
Yeah, you could you could share it now, Maurice. That's fine. If, for anybody who's wondering, um, what HR Prime does is we work with strategic partners across Canada, so we can make sure no matter where you are in this country, we can assist you. So Maurice is our guy in the Ottawa Quebec corridor. We have all the faith in him in the world. He's great with our clients, um, and uh, we work together that way. So by all means, uh, you could share your email, uh, your 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 phone number, or email now, um, or I can give you the name of the person who sent it, and you could send an email directly to him if that suits you. I did share the entry in, uh, oh, in perfect. the Q&A panel, but yeah, so. Uh, there we go, sweet. Okay, so uh, have, I think we have four or five questions here. So the first question, um, you mentioned about skill set, about the, the new kind of look that we're looking for from an HR perspective, an organization perspective, is skill sets rather than role-based. Um, how does an HR person or an organization take those skills and you know that variety of various skills and adopt that into uh, an operational or business plan. That's a good one. <laughs> um, it, what I would say is, uh, you know, again, it's going from from what what the objective is, right? So you have a business plan, you have established what what the goal is. You need to look at okay, what skills do I need in order to achieve that goal? And again, we're looking from you know achieving your business plan from a people's perspective. So what skills do I need? Um, you can, you know, I would say that in consulting lingo, do a skills gap analysis in very simplified terms. I say, okay, if I need somebody to have, I don't know, um, you know, uh, some skills in data analytics or uh, AI or just somebody who knows about customer service, you need to determine those, uh, you know, what you need. And then there's a lot of different ways to train people in those. There are, you know, the new trends and leading practices or whatever, but um, you need to find the best, the way that suits the best organization in order to train those people to acquire those skills. Um, I also recommend a lot of people track, uh, you know, track results. Uh, again, there's a bunch of different metrics that we can look at, but tracking uh, to see the effectiveness of that training or that, you know, that training program in, and trying to connect the dots with the business performance. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. Like, just to to add on to that a little bit more, I know I I find managing skill sets very much alike to managing workplace accommodations or those types of things. Having a workplace bank is that you know when you get to the same like, COVID has forced us to be so um, flexible and you know move quick. And you know it's nice that when you have a kind of a list of all these different skill sets that your employees either are using or actually possess, and then when you have to shift, um, you can look at this list of skill sets and say, okay we got someone who can technically handle this or with a little bit of training can get there. So um, I, I love that aspect of the presentation. It was a good question. Um, given that so much has changed because of COVID-19, how does the management team retool their training to become or continue being effective? You know, kind of the same a bit. Like it, it's understanding what, what is changing, what, what's being impacted, right? And, um, you know, this, this in this case, if I take this question, is about you know the training is driven by change. You know, so it's change management. So again, what is changing? How am I being impacted? And what what do I need to retrain people? Take the example of uh, what is the gym, for example, where they had to retain their staff, retrain their staff on the new procedures. So that's that's what you have to keep in mind in this case. Sometimes it's not that much about, and I'm not picking the question. It's not about retooling, but it's it's about making sure that people well connecting connect this to the skills or the requirement people have what they need in order to be able to do their job and be good at their jobs awesome excellent answer i really appreciate that um two more questions and then uh, we'll let you go we're, we're getting out of here right on time which is terrific um how can we be flexible with the policy that's a great one <laughs> um well, you know, and we have to differentiate because sometimes you have a policy that's compliance based, right? So those policies are what they are. But I would say uh, to be flexible with the policy is to keep it as general as possible. Um, the more you put in a policy, the more you're bounded to it. Um, if you're talking about remote workforce, uh, you know, if you start saying people, you're going to work remotely one day a week and you're going to be, I mean, it, it may be the case for your organization, but I'm giving this as an example. If if you're going to be working one day a week from home, you're going to be this, this, and that. It will be, become hard to manage exception and use judgment in some situation. And we're calling for it to be flexible. Flexibility means that you sometimes need to use that judgment, judgment, and make judgment calls. So 
take the policy as a guideline, right? And this is why I like to connect it with your philosophy. What's my philosophy on remote work? Um, then what's my, then you establish that policy and then you have the process and then you have the practices and people, we are, practices is what actually people end up doing. So you want to leave that to the people. But if they, if everything is in line, you shouldn't have many problems with a, I would say, a, not a vague, but a broader policy in itself. So it will give you that flexibility. Darcy. Oh, I am sorry, everyone. Uh, I was I was actually talking with my mic off. Go figure. Um, <laughs> um, yes, uh, thank you for the last answer. And my apologies again. Um, that was a terrific answer and uh, leads us to our last question. And it's actually a terrific question in so much as it really summarizes the uh, the actual subject matter that we discussed today and uh, gives you a, a really solid takeaway. Um, what would be the first thing to do to apply the content of this webinar to my workplace? As a consultant. Um, no, but kidding apart, joking apart is, <laughs> I would say... Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, um, listen, you need to determine, again, I'm going back to, I keep going back to that piece of being, you know, let me say being strategic, planning, knowing what's going to change. Determine what it's changing and then take that one thing that whether it's the quick win or the thing that brings the most value or what you need to fix right away. Take that one thing and do it and bring it on. Look at it from different perspectives. So what's your business objective with that? What are you trying to achieve? You know, you know, um, is this changing? Is this about changing my entire model or is this changing about a specific process? And then think about it from a user perspective. Again, the, the, whether it's a client, where is the employee um, and start with that one thing, get a win on that and then move on to the next one, you know, and that's a little bit of being agile as well. So even if it's just 80% good, just go with it, you know, just implement it, just do it. And you, you'll see changes happening. And then, you know, you move on to the next thing. And at the end, when you look back six months later, you would say, wow, I did an entire transformation just out of, I started with one thing and now I've done this full overhaul of what I have to do. Amazing. Uh that was terrific, Maurice. I can't, I can't tell you how grateful uh, we are um, at HR Prime to have you join us today. Um, as I said, you're part of an important part of our team. Um, and the wealth of knowledge and the specificity of your knowledge on this subject um, is beyond reproach. So thank you very much for joining us, or leading us, I should say. Well, thank you for having me. Again, as I said, it's a privilege and an honor for me to be here and sharing about this. It's uh, again, it's, I'm very passionate about this and I'm happy to, uh, to share. And I, uh, you know, thank everyone for uh, spending, uh, you know, their, uh, almost their lunchtime uh, with me rambling about, you know, about concepts and stuff. So thank you. Awesome. And for everyone who joined us today, I know a few people had to run. Um, thank you for joining us. I hope you found the information to be incredibly valuable. Uh, if you do have questions after you leave this webinar, um, don't hesitate to reach out to us at HR Prime to reach out to Maurice directly. If you reach out to us, we'll get the question to, to, uh, to Maurice uh, and, and we'll get you the answers you need. Uh, if there's any ideas that you have, I know there was the poll uh, that came up, which is an excellent feature. Um, but if there's any ideas that you want to hear about, any topics that you want to hear about, um, our free webinar series is part of us being able to reach out to our peers and potential clients or real clients. And uh, we're happy to uh, accommodate whatever topic that you want to hear about. Okay, so to all of you, I wish you the best of a day and uh, have uh, today being Thursday in advance. Have a great weekend. Take care.